Okay. Well, hello, Peter Richardson. How are you, my friend? I'm uh, fine, David. Yourself? All good, all good. And I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. I like to think of it as the past, present, and future of cultural evolutionary studies. And for our listeners, uh, we were actually departmental colleagues at UC Davis at the time when this all started. And you transitioned from a very well regarded limnologist um, to what you've done, what you're now so well known for, the study of cultural evolution. And I wonder if you could begin just by telling that story, how you got together with Rob Boyd and and uh, why you felt drawn to, to study uh, human cultural evolution. Well, <clears throat> I uh, uh, was hired into the uh, Division of Environmental Studies as it was then, uh, maybe three years, two, three years before you came. I can't remember exactly. And uh, I had this colleague, you may re remember Jim McAvoy, who was one of the founding members of the division. And uh, he had put on the books in the planning phase of this uh, uh, department. Uh, well, it was called a division, but it was really just a department, wasn't it? And uh, uh, he put this course he called the principles of human ecology on the on the books and so when it came time to actually teach it he decided he needed a natural scientist to help him teach it so uh, uh, I uh, went in with him and and uh, uh, helped him teach that course and we decided that one of the uh, themes of the course uh, one of the sort of organizing principles would be the notion of adaptation and I had had enough uh, evolutionary biology that I had a pretty firm idea of what an adaptation was from a from a uh, biological evolution point of view. But uh, I knew enough anthropology from some casual reading I'd done to, to oh, know. I'm remembering, Peter, I'm remembering. Um, I, I've, I've often thought of you as my attic in terms of uh, <laughs> all the different things you know. So, but Yeah, going. well, dusty, confused. A, a big trash heap. Yeah, that that fits <laughs> all the old stuff that nobody wants anymore. Uh, so uh, I, I knew that uh, uh, human adaptations were substantially cultural. There were these uh, anthropologists who called themselves cultural ecologists who yeah. uh, uh, work that went back to the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, that was, you know, pretty convincing. So uh, I... Uh, decided I'd uh, go find out what uh, these uh, anthropologists had to say about how cultural adaptations came about. And compared to what I'd learned in evolutionary biology, what they had to say was, I don't know, I what word would I use? Primitive? Uh, uh, barely <laughs> Savage? There. Savage? Barbarian? Can... <laughs> well, something like that. <laughs> uh, they were... Uh, uh, they hadn't done anything really uh, uh, comparable to evolutionary biology for 75 years or something. So, you know, they were way behind uh, uh, evolutionary advances in evolutionary biology. That's a whole uh, another, another story. story but you know, I mean, just for symmetry, Pete, I, I say this again and again, but, um, you know, uh, evolutionary biology seeded that ground also when it became gene centric and uh, you know, just based on Mendelian genetics. And so it, it uh, seeded the study of cultural evolution to other disciplines. And then those disciplines um, are more or less, as you just said. So it was just like, yeah. found, I think, is the yeah. way I would think of it. Yeah, Darwin laid a pretty good foundation. He wasn't a bad cultural evolutionist, really, um, when he talked about humans and the descent of man. In, yeah. in fact, of course, he was a better cultural evolutionist and he was a biological evolutionist in the sense that he had his version of genetics was all wrong. Uh, uh, well, at least it, it, the population geneticist Tarted is all wrong now. They, now the extended evolutionary synthesis has brought, brought some of his ideas about Lamarckian inheritance back into the, or they're tempted to bring it back into the fold. That's another story. But the uh, uh, and uh, there were uh, late 19th century uh, people uh, uh, that uh, were tolerably good uh, um, evolutionists uh, in this in the, what were becoming the social scientists. Uh, 
sciences. Who would you who would you name? Uh, well, uh, so um, the uh, uh, James Mark Baldwin is, is yeah. A good oh yeah, and uh, people talk about economists like Thorsten Veblen as. I just yeah. read a biography of him, and uh, that biography we we we're in great danger of going off on many tangents, Pete. So, but uh, but yeah. um, the biography I just finished reading of him, and I'm actually interviewing the uh, 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 the author. Uh, so I'll have a podcast with him. But the history of thinking during that era, evolutionary thinking, it was so very interesting but we i digress so let's get back on track here well so your the, own entry. The, to finish up <laughs> the digression the, the long and the short of it was that evolution got lost in the foundation of the modern social science disciplines no none of the disciplines really adopted uh, uh darwinian ideas it was sort of the nadir of uh of the prestige of darwinism around the turn of the 20th century anyway so uh the uh, it took a while for things to get back on track in in biology and and by that time uh, Darwin was a biologist. I mean this is crazy, but uh, uh, Darwin is the, the his nineteenth uh, century contributions to the social sciences are are uh, nearly completely forgotten to the point where he's just not considered one of the founding fathers, which he ought to have been. So. Uh, 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 basically, when uh, I saw how crude the uh, uh, adaptationist ideas of the uh, cultural ecologists were, uh, it looked to me like there was a big research project there, which basically uh, is correcting the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century errors in, in, in forgetting Darwinism. So uh, uh, and Rob and I were uh, teaching a different course together. At any rate, I, I turned what I found into a lecture for Jim's course. And then uh, I was teaching another course with Rob and we fell to talking. And finally, we decided there was a uh, uh, research project there. And the rest is is history, so to speak. It's history. Yeah. Well, at that time, I mean, uh, Dawkins had coined his famous term memes and uh, and uh, but the approach that you developed uh, with Rob is different than when what became of that concept. And I just wonder if you could speak a little bit about um, just your early formulations. And I know, I mean, when I describe them, I say that you were basing your models on um, population genetic theory uh, developed 50 years earlier for population genetics. You were then adapting to the evolution of cultural traits, but how did your ideas fit with um, Dawkins and and uh, and uh, am I right that that's basically that you were re retooling uh, population uh, genetic theory? Yeah, well, uh, the our earliest paper, interestingly enough, was a game theory based uh, paper that uh, uh, because Rob didn't know any population genetics when we started out, uh, and he's the uh, mathematician in our little team. And His background was what? Uh, environmental science, right? Forestry? Well, he, he was a uh, physics undergraduate major, and he decided he wanted to become uh, an environmental policy analyst. Uh, and so uh, the, his advisor, at, he was at, uh, in the founding class of UC San Diego, and, and his advisor sent him up to uh, uh, to be a PhD student of a guy named Ken Watt, you probably remember Ken. He was a <laughs> he was a character about a mile wide and a mile high uh, in terms of his. Uh, we, we, the day know. the day that I came to Davis, we met him, and he I, I'll never forget this story. He said, "All my life, I told my children, you can do anything you want, anything, and it never occurred to me that they might decide to do nothing at all." <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, that was, uh, uh, Ken had a big, well-funded project to make a model of the world that was supposed <laughs> to be a realistic model of the world. This is back when simulation modeling was in its infancy, infancy and, and uh, Ken was, uh, and his team were extremely naive about what they could do, and the whole thing just sort of collapsed in a mess. <laughs> but, uh, uh, 
any rate, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, uh, Rob's uh, training mathematical social sciences was uh, in economics. He'd taken the uh, basic economics graduate course sequence in uh, Davis because, well, never mind why. Uh, but uh, uh, so he was uh, uh, pretty good with game theory. And so we set up this game theory model uh, that we published in 1978. And uh, it imagined that the, there was a kind of a contest between a not necessarily zero sum contest between genes and culture to control the phenotype of organisms. And so the, uh, uh, and there uh, was a, some, some conflict of interest between genes and culture because uh, genes aren't transmitted and culture aren't transmitted to the next generation sure. in a way. And so uh, what is good for cultural fitness is not necessarily good for genetic fitness, but uh, on the whole, there's uh, uh, more positive sum than negative sum or else culture would never have evolved in the first place. That was kind, yeah. of, that right. was kind of the setup. Uh, but uh, uh, in uh, 1976, uh, I had my first sabbatical coming up and and Rob was had had a job. He'd worked for the California Energy Commission for a few years, and he decided he really wanted to be an academic after all this. This environmental policy analysis was kind of he was bored with it. So we went uh, down to Berkeley and started to work on what eventually became our eighty-five book. And we'd heard that Cavalli, Swartz, and Feldman were teaching a seminar that was yeah. Uh, that was the work that led to their uh, 81 book. Uh, and uh, so we asked if we could sit in on their seminar and they said, sure. And so once a week we drove over to Stanford and, and, and so that's where Rob and I got an introduction to uh, population genetics. I knew a little population genetics, but uh, uh, I wasn't a pro. And uh, of course, uh, Mark and Cavalli were, and so we, and they'd already published a couple of three papers uh, using the population genetics uh, formalism. So we, by and large, adopted that. Uh, a few years ago, somebody uh, commented on that old '78 paper of ours and said we went astray when we were, we got involved in all this population genetics stuff. We should <laughs> stuck with the game theory. <laughs> so well, at what point did well, what point did uh... Group selection entered into this because some of this is not necessarily multi-level, but uh, but now of course we know that uh, that you can't really talk about human evolution without talking about group level selection. So where what point did this this group selection kind of raise its head as as an important but, thing to uh, to be included? Uh, Rob and I started talking about you know this was the days of G. C. Williams, and so I when uh, we felt a talking about it the first time is uh, I just tried it out the GC Williams style uh, group selection is more or less impossible uh, you know, line and uh, Rob said you better be careful uh, cultural evolution isn't like uh, genetic evolution and what's uh, maybe difficult in the case of genes might not be so difficult in the case of, of culture and, and so I he was a smart guy, so I didn't. Uh, I listened, and so, and and pretty quick, we had a model that came out, I think, in human ecology in '83 or something. It was a group selection model. It depended upon uh, a conformist transmission to yeah. uh, uh, protect uh, 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 cultural variation against the uh, corrosive effects of migration. So the same yeah. amount of migration that would uh, uh, basically homogenize a uh, uh, physical migration that would homogenize a genetic two genetic populations uh, wouldn't necessarily in the face of conformist transmission do the same to cultural variation and you know later on we worked on other things like ethnic markers and and basically uh, uh, culture evolves faster than uh, genes so uh, it can throw up uh, 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 cultural variation uh, by various mechanisms faster than migration can wear the, var the variation between two groups away. At least that's our 
uh, our argument uh, uh, in in its sort of final form that started with that 83 paper. Yeah, and I think uh, the modern version of this, I think, is equilibrium selection, selection among multiple locally stable equilibria, and those equilibria having much to do with norms. And so one of your famous papers, what was the title? But basically, evolution stabilizes cooperation or anything else. <laughs> um, can can stabilize cooperation or anything else yeah yeah so uh, well, uh, the uh, I mean this is the period in which um, evolutionary psychology also ar arose and uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time on the relationship between what became known as the kind of the Richardson Boyd tradition and the um, Cosmides Tubi style evolutionary psychology and I think what was so remarkable for me about all of that and represented by the early days of the Human Behavior and Evolution Society was that these people now bravely studying human behavior from an evolutionary perspective were, were pioneers for that, but totally doctrinaire about their individualistic focus. So for them, Williams and Dawkins and Maynard Smith were, were just the, you know, the, the sages um, and, um, and uh, group selection was um, um, as heretical for them, <laughs> and uh, and so yeah. they were bold in some respects and doctrinaire in other respects. And I think it's still the case. I'm I'm interested to know your impression about first of all the difference between those two approaches that started back then and the extent to which they've grown together. Well, uh, the uh, I wrote an essay about this. Uh, 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 for a book that uh, 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 Richard Lewins, do you know him, mm -hmm. uh, the English philosopher? Uh, at any rate, he and a, one of his collaborators uh, co-authored or co-edited a book that I contributed a chapter to a few years ago. And I went back through all that uh, historical stuff. And it really starts with Ed Wilson uh, in his uh and his uh, on human nature book that, and then the sort of math, math mathematicalization of it in the in the book with uh, Charles Lumpson, and yeah. and uh, both of those uh, books have a, a a strong commitment to the to the modern synthesis, and in the modern synthesis there are uh, proximal and ultimate causes, right, and genes evolution of genes is the ultimate cause of everything and culture can't be anything but a uh, uh, like ordinary learning it's a proximal uh mechanism that can't okay. have in the service so the short leash we're going to get to the leash metaphor here i have a feeling yeah, yeah so the leash metaphor and uh although uh uh to be in cosmetics don't give uh E.O. Wilson much credit. It's the same thing. They talk about modules, and he talked about uh, 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 epigenetic rules, and so there are a few terminological differences, but but uh, as far as I can tell, zero real substantive difference between between their approach and his approach. And and they're uh, of course they don't make mathematical models, and in one virtue of mathematical models is that they they uh or it says you to be explicit for, well force you to be explicit and then then you can be explicitly critiqued because it's all there or it, it also if their uh empirical uh data are, are similar if you have enough empirical data then you can uh talk about con concrete things uh, but uh, uh to be in cosmetics i found them a, they're they're uh, quite elliptical uh about it, they have this critique of of what they call a standard social science model, uh, which, uh, viewed one way, uh, puts culture in in its place. Uh, viewed another way, it's uh, uh, it's a uh, argument that uh, uh, culture just isn't important. It's a proximal cause, and and we really should focus on genes and forget about this. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah it's very gene very gene centric. And uh, Steve Pinker is is was is the uh, most uh, explicitly uh, uh, 
what I want to say, uh, colorful about in his rejection of the importance of culture. He's got that essay where he calls cultural group selection dust bunnies. Do you remember that one? <laughs> yeah, but, I know it. I know it. But, but uh, Tubi and Cosmides themselves are uh, very difficult to read. Uh, they, uh, uh, it's, you know, it, it sounds like politicians' uh, speeches in front of a mixed audience. <laughs> they're, they're trying to have it both ways. Well, uh, you know, a metaphor that I think gets it just right is uh, the metaphor of the adaptive and innate component of the immune system. So the immune system has an innate component, densely modular, evolved by genetic evolution, does not change during the lifetime of the organism. There's your EP, but it also has the adaptive component, uh, which is an open-ended evolutionary process. There's your standard social science model. So the standard social science model and the EP actually do go together um, and you, uh, yeah. I find that to be a, a really nice way of thinking of basically our evolved behavioral system is like our immune system with an innate and adaptive component. Have you ever thought of it that way? Uh, yeah, the, uh, I wrote another essay a few years ago that uh, reviewed uh, uh, the work that uses uh, the Bayesian concept as a foundation. Uh, so uh, uh, Robin, one of his students, wrote a paper on it, and there's a, uh, a I guess he, what is he, a psychologist or a, a guy named uh, Joel Tenenbaum, uh, who's at, uh, out there in some, is he at Columbia or some uh, big shot Eastern University that we state school boys out here don't give a rat's ass about <laughs> Uh, he he's a real smart guy, and he's had a number of smart collaborators. And uh, so the concept is, just as you say, that there are priors that uh, uh, you imagine a person, uh, in the first instance, an individual sitting in some environment <clears throat> that's uh, uh, the environments are changing all the time. And so uh, 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 you're having to cope with uh, uh, an uncertain and changing environment. So you inherit uh, genetically and culturally uh, priors. Uh, 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 the uh, evolution has crafted uh, your genes and your culture to uh, anticipate as best as possible what kind of world, world you're living in. But that's always imperfect because of, of uh, ongoing change. And so you also collect information about data about what the world is actually like and you modify your priors or you modify your behavior uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, taking some uh, uh, information from your priors and some from from the data you receive about the contemporary environment and, yeah and you just and you iteratively do this every every day is a new day and every day you learned something yesterday and and uh, you've modified your priors uh, based upon accumulating experience, but the world is always changing. So you never know, but what you're not going to get some kind of surprise uh, uh, today that'll uh, uh, encourage you to uh, change, uh, to modify your priors. And so that's uh, just an ongoing process in which uh, genes, culture, and well, the immune system is interesting. I, I talked about this a little bit in the, that essay I wrote. The immune system, what the immune system is really costly. I didn't realize this, but to mount an immune defense, that's why you're sick when you're uh, when you're sick. Uh, your immune system is uh, is devoting a bunch of resources to fighting off whatever it is that's attacking you, and and that makes you sick. Well, uh, but what makes you sick is aversive, right? So if you have any uh, any capacity to understand what sort of environmental factors caused your your sickness, uh, you'll reform, right? You'll do something different next time and just to avoid the unpleasantness of, of being sick. So I argued that all of these uh, 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 immune systems, uh, other uh, phenotypic adaptation mechanisms, uh, uh, feed into uh, cultural evolution and ultimately into into genetic evolution, and and so the uh, 
it's a uh, complex uh, uh, interlinked uh, uh, adaptive system that is run on Bayesian principles. That's the yeah, okay. argument that uh, goes back to, well, I don't know what, I guess it goes back to Bayes, right? Uh, but uh, 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 Tenenbaum is, uh, and his colleagues, and uh, Alison Gopnik at, uh, at Berkeley is another person who's written on this. So there's a, uh, a fair clutch of uh, people who've uh, subscribed to this idea. Well, let's let's fast forward to the present. So uh, first of all, your lineage, academic lineage, is amazing. Um, I mean, so many people that uh, trained directly under you and Rob, and then their students, uh, people like Joe Henrik and Michael Muthukrishna, plus many others, um, and you were uh, involved in the formation of the Cultural Evolution Society along with myself. You served as president. And so what's your assessment of the current state of cultural evolutionary uh, theory? And then I'll ask some more specific questions, but uh, I'd love to know what your assessment is of what's taken place. How, has it, you know, the maturation basically of the paradigm? Yeah, so it, it seems to me that uh, it's... Uh... It's it's grown quite substantially since, since the early days. I mean, uh, back around 1985 or so, you could have put all the active researchers uh, uh, in cultural evolution, at least in this tradition, uh, in a small conference room. <laughs> a Volkswagen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you, if you were willing to pack them in in a in a clown car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, so uh, now we've got a society, I don't know what the current uh, several hundred members in the Cultural Evolution Society, and, and that's uh, far from all of the people either. I mean, there are uh, quite a number of people in, in evolutionary linguistics, for example, uh, 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 that uh, uh, most of whom don't attend uh, Cultural Evolution Society meetings. And, and, and there are a fair number of other uh, economists. There are uh, quite a number of uh, pretty sophisticated uh, cultural evolutionists among the economists this, these days. Uh, uh, Nathan Nunn comes to mind, and, and of yeah. course, Herb Gett. Especially, the, especially the history historical economists. Yeah, economic historians have, uh, well, ever since... Uh, 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 Nelson and Winter, for uh, uh, dating back to the early 1980s, uh, there have been people who've been interested. There, there's a little uh, subset of economists that call themselves evolutionary economists, and most of them trace their ancestry to Nelson. And uh, they do, uh, Pete. But uh, Jeff Hodgson, who I'm pretty sure you know, um, is um, has written a small book uh, on an analysis of evolutionary economics. And, and what he shows is that um, um, it's it really is not connected to the cultural evolution as, as we know it. And it has no conceptual center. I can send you those, uh, those, um, uh, those references. And isn't necessarily even Darwinian uh, in the broad use of, uh, of the term uh, evolution. And so there's a sense in which the uh, Nelson and Winter uh, tradition uh, hasn't really converged as much as you might think with the rest of this. And of course it should. I mean, he calls, for, Jeffrey calls for that and so would we, but, uh, and of course there's great people that, you know, Ulrich Bett and, and um, uh, J.P. J.W. Stolhorst, who, which with whom you've written articles. So, so anyhow, yeah. Um, uh, there's a couple of points I want to ask you about. Uh, and one is forms of cultural evolution that are not kind of raw selection among groups, things like imitation and so on. So they're they're cultural evolution, but they're 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 selecting among some like you know virtual worlds or something like that, so that so that it's not actually the case that you have, you know, multiple groups and there's differential survival and reproduction among the groups. So can you help me with that? And just uh, how- Well, uh, so, yeah. Uh, 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 
going back to Rob's and my 85 book, we talked about decision-making forces in that book. Yeah, that's what and I want to so, learn about. Uh, the uh, 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 cultural variation, uh, it seems to me, is subject to uh, uh, to ordinary natural selection. You know, if you if you have the habit of drinking and driving, uh, uh, this is likely to lead to an early death, and and yeah. you will be held up to children as a as an object lesson and not what not to do. Uh, uh, so the, there is that aspect of it, but uh, uh, at least in the short run, it seems to be far more important are these decision making forces. Uh, we call them. Uh, bias forces and guided variation. So guided variation is just uh, taking ordinary in individual learning, uh, at least in the simplest models that we made, just take ordinary individual learning and then transmit the products of lear learning to your offspring or to your uh, to your colleagues. Uh, uh, or if it, you know, if you discover something, uh, some successful way of doing something, people are liable to uh, imitate you. So, uh, uh, so the, uh, a combination of, uh, uh, of biased teaching and biased uh, learning uh, plus uh, learning for individual learning, all are uh, acting on as forces on, on cultural evolution. Uh, uh, so uh, oh, uh, 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 Rob and I made a, a model in our 85 book of, uh, of a prestige bias, imitate prestigious people. And how do people get prestige? Well, uh, uh, you know, like the Kardashians, they have prestige because they have prestige. They're celebrities because they're celebrities. <laughs> and so we showed that, uh, well, we made a little model. Well, with Rep, you just, uh, just to add on, with Rep, I mean, the, the wonderful distinction between dominance and status were basically status earned by reputation for which you have to do well by the group as opposed to just dominance. You just Powerful well, take. You, you um, don't have to necessarily do well for the group. The, in other words, it has a. Uh, it's like uh, runaway sexual selection in the, the little model that Rob and I made. Yeah, operate, can be. It can be, and so you you think of uh, of the spread of fa fads and fashions and uh, and uh, crazy cults or Donald Trump Trumpism. I mean, these are uh, things that. Uh, seem to run out of control at least uh, uh they seem so to me and and that uh i've kind of been disappointed in in the uh, uh most people don't bother to under even understand that little model we made it it seems to me it's much more important than most other cultural evolutionists uh, uh, think it is and i'm not sure the model that rob and i made is the right one uh, uh i'm not sure that it covers the it, it depicts the uh, dynamic processes in the best way possible, but uh, it seems to me it's an important topic, uh, particularly given the damage that uh, runaway processes can sometimes yeah. Uh, yeah. cause. Uh, I mean, this. Uh, I mean, the the global uh, sustainability crisis is as much as anything a problem of runaway affluence. Uh, uh, right have far more than we need and uh and uh, well those of us in the uh in the first world too and yeah i think when we get to the final chapter of this conversation i'm going to ask you about like things like ai and social media and things like things like that but is it safe to say that an explicit process of decision making is a cultural evolutionary process in which you have some target something you're trying to do there's your target of selection you you weigh alternatives there's your variation you select what works there's your replication is that yeah. is that anything wrong with that characterization that just flat out decision making is a is a like a conscious cultural evolutionary process well it it begs the question of where the uh in the first instance it begs the question of of where the uh, uh objectives that the decision maker has in mind come from right uh, so uh, don campbell actually we should have used his terminology because he invented the idea. Uh, he talked about vicarious selectors. Do you remember? Yeah. That? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so he imagined that natural selection operating on genes or, or maybe on culture 
uh, would uh, uh, create these uh, priors we were talking about in the Bayesian sense. And uh, these priors stand in for, for natural selection. They're the product of natural selection, but when they're applied at a decision-making context, they're standing in for natural selection. They're trying to do natural selections work uh, uh, in anticipation rather than uh, in other words, uh, the whole reason for phenotypic flexibility is is to evade natural selection. Natural selection, at least negative natural selection, is nasty stuff. Uh, we don't want to go there if we can possibly help it. So uh, this it applies to all sorts of, uh, of mechanisms of phenotypic flexibility. Culture is just a special case. Uh, this, uh, it's a special, special case in the sense that it acts as an inheritance system, so it has uh, some of the same dynamic properties as genes do and others that are sort of analogous to what genes do, but different. Uh, so uh, that's the way I think of it is that uh, uh, in the long run, uh, these priors are, are shaped by natural selection, uh, but uh, they can't cope with the... Uh, uh, with the uncertainties of and complexities of everyday environmental change. And so you have these mechanisms of phenotypic flexibility to do the best they can when, uh, when uh, things go awry and uh, which they are always doing. And, and it doesn't necessarily work. Uh, uh, I, I mean, the fate of most lineages is to go extinct, right? So, uh, uh, sooner or later, you run into something, or a population runs into something that it it can't uh, work its way around. And it. Oh yeah, and then I think also so a couple of points to make here. First, back to decision making. I think the, uh, Campbell's term vicarious selection tells us that uh, no matter what the uh, object of the the objective of the decision making is, um, once you have it, then and you you have a little miniature cultural evolutionary process that heads towards that goal. There doesn't have to be a tight connection between the decision-making objective and and genetic evolution or anything else. It's just, it has become the objective. And there's a little cultural evolutionary process that spins around it. Is that is that safe to say? Yeah, and uh, uh, so it can, uh, in, in these runaway type uh, situations, it can go badly astray. I mean- Very badly astray. Your objective function in in terms of decision making is is spinning out of control, and uh, 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 and that's not it seems to me unusual at all in 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 cultural systems. So. And and of course the intended intentions sort of collide and produce unintended consequences. So I know a favorite example of both of us is the Nora conquest, the, uh, the African pastoralist tribes, the Nora and yeah. the Dinka in which um, the uh, Noor had a competitive advantage over the Dinka based on many cultural practices. All of those cultural practices involved such things as, you know, herding their cattle and ride price and things like that. So they were thinking hard at that level. And those things combined to produce the group level effect of which all of them were totally unaware. And so intentions basically produced random variation or quasi-random variation, right? Yeah, well, I think uh, of it, something like that, that uh, 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 in our chapter on the runaway process, Rob and I uh, argued that uh, uh, these uh, runaway uh, dynamics uh, create variation at the, at the group level, and uh, uh, they create religious beliefs and things like that. And, and it turns out to be hard to, uh, even if you know the practical uh, implications of these things, the, the Dinka must have known that they were getting a tar beat out of them by the new air, uh, but they they couldn't figure out how to fix, the, uh, fix it. They just kept losing according to the his, history. So, uh, uh, and the same thing is, is true uh, uh, in, modern economic competition between fancy modern corporations with college educated CEOs. Uh, uh, I mean, why did Amazon ever come about? We had uh, 
uh, Sears Roebuck and Montgomery Wards, uh, uh, catalog retailing companies that took advantage of the postal system to uh, uh, to become big, uh, famous uh, companies, dominant in their markets in their day. And yet uh, well, they couldn't figure out how to use the Internet to do the same thing that the post office had been doing for them for a century. They just, you know, they just are on... Uh, it's as if they're on cruise control. They've got this. Yeah, it is. So there, a... this, these priors, and the priors are way too strong uh, for to uh, uh, let them innovate. Uh, uh, old companies die, and, and uh, few of them uh, innovate more than a, a few generations before. Yeah, they... that's right. That's right. Very few companies stay in the Fortune 500 for long. For more than twenty or thirty years, so uh, so uh, yeah, to be adaptable is different than to be ad currently adapted. Right, and um, and uh, we there's one way or the other, I think. Uh, yeah, there is. There's, there's a book I'm trying to think. It's Charles O'Reilly, I think. Um, the the ambidextrous organization, in which uh, the whole point is that um, innovation calls for a different culture than than turning out uh, turning out widgets. You know. Uh, um, efficiently so that uh, you almost for if an organization is going to remain in the running adaptable it actually has to do two things well it has to do what it's currently doing well and then it has to innovate well and those have to be it's like being ambidextrous so uh so yeah. uh, some quite interesting you know the marketing literature as you know pete um is quite interesting for for uh, these sorts of issues um let me, uh, I want to turn to the, or, or go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that the Times, New York Times carried an article today about uh, the latest wave of uh, corporate layoffs and high tech land. And, and according to the author of the story, this is, this actually is nuts. They're, they're, uh, they're, they take great pride on being adaptable and nimble and, and innovative and, all of those things on the, but they're, uh, according to this article, they're doing uh, crazy things. That, that uh, in this, I uh, I learned uh, back in my brief uh, career as a uh, as a business guru uh, 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 that uh, major corporate restructurings and things like that fail between somewhere between sixty and eighty percent of the time. <laughs> depending upon what your criterion for failure and, and success it's something a lot of things of course half succeed or quarter succeed and, uh, but uh, the uh, this uh, article suggested that the uh, layoff craze is is another one of these things that uh, it's a fad that that is failing yeah uh, yeah there's so much could be said along those um, along those lines. I want to I want to dwell on the topic of conscious evolution, um, or an intentional component to uh, evolution, because of course that was seemed to be uh, uh, exorcised by the modern synthesis um, as if evolution has no purpose. Organisms just vary; only the immediate environment does the selection. But then we have you've already uh, mentioned Baldwin um, yeah. and the Baldwin effect, uh, which was um quite well recognized at the time as as an important development but never really found its footing in my view um and now as we study cultural evolution human cultural evolution and not only that but but when we when we look back at such things as artificial selection uh sexual selection what we now call social selection self domestication then even if we're for genetic evolution, we should be admitting more of an intentional component, and especially in the case of human cultural evolution. So what are your thoughts on on a conscious or intentional component to evolution in general and well, human cultural uh, evolution in I, particular? I, um, I personally think that the consciousness part of it is, is a red herring, but... Uh, because what's conscious? And lots of, I mean, Freud taught us that lots of things in the brain are are 
behaving in quite law-like ways that are not accessible to consciousness. So uh, okay. that's why uh, uh, I, I've taken up this modern term agentic uh, uh, to cover it. Uh, so as you say, uh, uh, biology is rife with agentic selection processes, uh, social selection and sexual selection uh, are among the most prominent uh, uh, and important, I think. And, and in the case of humans, uh, uh, we do all of this uh, uh, agentic selection. Uh, uh, well, for example, I, I have this idea that uh, uh, if you take uh, the dominance orientation of, uh, of chimpanzees, let's say, that are strongly dominant, to have a strong dominance drive, uh, and humans have a much weaker dominance drive. I mean, uh, uh, people who behave like uh, like uh, dominant male chimpanzees, we call them psychopaths, I think, or something. They're awful close to that. Uh, I had gotten in an argument with Franz Duval about this one time when I described uh, chimpanzees as psychopaths, and he took great umbrage at this. Yeah, see, he just sadly passed away. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah, he just a few days ago. So homage to Franz Duval. Yeah, uh, right. And and there was a, I mean, uh, uh, but quite a quite a disparity of of views. When on the one hand, he was very much on the kind of the moral and nurturing side, but then we have the work of Joan Silken. Um, I'm thinking of a study in particular who did basically behavioral economics games, giving chimps a choice between a reward uh, versus the same reward plus a reward for another chimp. And they were indifferent. <laughs> they didn't yeah. care. So yeah. it's just like a complete lack of empathy by that measure. Um, yeah. And we well, have Richard Wrangham, of course, and, and uh, Christopher Bohm, all saying that there's a night and day difference between chimp society and human society with respect to cooperation, one of the main differences being social control. Although I know in your book with Leslie, um, you emphasize that plus more with uh, basically the demands for cooperation um, on the savannah. Maybe you could just uh, talk a little bit about your book with Leslie and and uh, and just uh, what, what caused humans to be become ultra social. Well, it, it seems to me that uh, uh... We gradually built up a uh, an adaptive system that w was uh, built around exploiting the advantages of uh, culture, and I've come to think uh, that it's an old argument uh, that uh, goes back in part to Darwin uh, that uh, what makes you one of the things that makes humans unique by way of a pre adaptation is hands. We have these hands that in the Amongst Australopithecines, were freed up from uh, from locomotion for the most part, and uh, so they became specialized for we don't know what do we what were Australopithecines doing with those hands except waving at each other with them? <laughs> I don't think we know. Uh, they certainly, uh, I mean, presumably they were using them for uh, expedient tools the way chimpanzees do. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 Rob had this idea that uh, they uh, that Australopithecines, uh, uh, you know, small, vulnerable, uh, uh, just a nice lunch for a lion or a uh, leopard uh, running around on the savanna, kind of slowly. Uh, uh, how did they protect themselves against uh, all of those predators uh, away from the trees? This is something that. Leslie and I dealt with in our in our yeah that's Leslie Newson in your book A Story of Us I say A Story of Us I once the story. said the story of us and I'll never do that again so, yeah not uh and so uh well, Leslie has a particular hypothesis but uh uh, uh Rob imagined that uh, carrying sticks and stones around was necessary for defense and that uh, Australopithecines went around in a big mob uh, so that this might be the uh, the original origins of human style cooperation, and they did this for defense and and maybe for offense too. They might have uh, pushed uh, hyenas and even lions off of kills by just being you know a hundred of them armed with sticks and stones and and uh, mean little bastards. <laughs> Not very fast. 
<laughs> fairly and smart. There's the, I mean, there's Paul Degen's stone throwing hypothesis, which is uh, you know, fairly intriguing. Not 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 the whole story, but the idea that throwing stones came first, and then we could stone each other. <laughs> the, <Yeah>. Well, <laughs> yeah, that, it's a uh, and uh, oh, there's a uh, an older uh, evolution human evolutionist. I'm blanking on his name. Uh, he was at the University of Chicago, I think. At any rate, he's got a book from the mid 20th century in which he's got plates. And one of the plates does show uh, uh, Bob of Australopithecines throwing stones at some predator. So it's, a, it's an idea that's been around uh, off and on for a while. But I, you know, I think it's quite uh, plausible. And I think that the idea that hands... Uh, uh, can be used to make and use tools is is probably really important. Uh, I first heard uh, this from uh, Sherwood Washburn. Does that name mean anything? Sure, sure. Uh, uh, he was uh, at Berkeley when I was a freshman there, and he gave. I took his course in in uh, uh, physical anthropology and and. Uh, he had this idea that there was positive that in Australopithecines there was a sort of a positive feedback that ran away uh, tools, brains, hands. We they had the hands that set off a, a tool making binge, which selected for bigger brains, and the the whole thing just ran from there. Now, of course, the problem was that Australopithecines were bipedal for a couple of million years and didn't do anything by way of that we can yeah, tell there's mysteries Based there you have a whole I, I i i this could go on very pleasantly for a long time but say a little about climate change because uh that's part of your thinking is the uh, climate change in the past uh, as being an important part of the human evolutionary story yeah uh uh rob and i started thinking about that uh in during the time we wrote our 85 book, because when you can think of the 85 book as a as a sort of a functional analysis of culture, what what's culture good for? Uh, and so then why might humans have it? And it, uh, we convinced ourselves that the, on the basis of the modeling exercise that, that uh, you could evolve a costly uh, system for uh, cultural evolution uh, as a response to uh, uh, temporal and spatial uh, variability, uh, that it was for coping with uh, if you're migrating about the landscape and you're going to run into different kinds of environments and you're going to have to cope with that. Uh, if you're sitting in one place, then there's ongoing uh, climate change. Now, this is this is a you know a very generic. Uh, uh, kind of argument it, it applies to any as we were sure, just really, learning any form yeah. of uh, phenotypic flexibility so what's yeah. particular about peculiar about culture well uh we convinced ourselves that it was an adaptation to uh uh high frequency climate variation if the climate changes slowly enough then uh genes keep up well enough if it changes really rapidly on a sort of a sub generational time scale, then only uh, things like individual learning and other forms of individual level phenotypic flexibility are, are good for that. What culture is good for is it can uh, accumulate a cultural adaptation over, over a significant period of time. Uh, 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 faster, it's faster than genes, but, uh, uh, and slower than individual level phenotypic flexibility, but it has a, a its biggest advantage uh, in, uh, uh, we were thinking of uh, uh, climate with its changing on the time scale of uh, centuries or millennia, not tens of millennia and, and not annually, but uh, right. so with horizontal transmission, you can push it into shorter and shorter uh, time scale uh, fluctuations. Uh, uh, because if one person invents something and they spread it rapidly to the rest of their of their groups say eh, that uh, could be an advantage in even things that are changing on the annual time scale. Uh, right. Uh, but the, we thought that the big deal would be uh, millennial and submillennial scale variation, which at that time we knew very little about. Uh, there were some hints uh, 
uh, from Greenland ice cores that uh, uh, back in the 80s that uh, that there was that the last ice age was maybe more variable than the Holocene, uh, but the ice cores were all taken from the margins of the of the Greenland ice cap, and uh, it was not very convincing. I remember I tried to talk Rob into speculating more than he was comfortable with it. Well, we we must know more now. What's what's the what's the, uh... well? So by the by the mid nineties, uh, uh, the uh, these uh, Greenland two uh, replicate Greenland ice cores were drilled on the ice divide up in the middle of the ice sheet, uh, where the uh, so the problem is that as the ice spreads, it basically is turbulent and it mixes everything up and, right. and makes a lousy record. But uh, on the on the uh, ice divide, uh, the uh, layers are shrinking. They're getting thinner and thinner as they get older, uh, but they're not flowing. Uh, and so that there, you get a, uh, uh, a pretty record of the uh, climate change. And so uh, back about, uh, oh, 80,000 years, uh, the, the two cores replicated themselves almost perfectly. I think they were drilled a mile or so apart. I can't remember, but... Uh, uh, so this was a, a considerable logistics achievement to get all that gear up on the ice divide a hell of a long ways from the coast and, and high elevation, colder than the uh, proverbial uh, devils. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, the, uh, that left a beautiful record, but it, relatively short. And it wasn't until the... Uh, 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 07 and 08 uh, that uh, longer cores became available. One uh, core from Antarctica that's uh, high resolution back eight glacial cycles and another one from uh, a marine core uh, from the uh, uh, off of Iberia uh, uh, four glacial cycles. And, and they, they seem to show that there was an ongoing increase in the high frequency variation over time that the, the the pleistocene is a move, moving fee so to speak if you're thinking of you know, this high frequency climate variation and there's uh recently there's i has i spent a couple of days trying to puzzle at this paper that i found on a preprint uh, uh back in oh uh, september november and uh I got distracted by other things, but it, there, there has been this core race that goes back about a million and a half years now. Uh, and this was the first uh, comprehensive paper I could find on it. And uh, it, it does seem to show that the lower Pleistocene was even less variable than the middle and, and later Pleistocene. Uh, but it doesn't replicate the eight cycle and four cycle data very well. And I don't know why it should. It's taken uh, right next to the place where the where the four cycle core was uh, was taken. So, so I need I, I need to see the forest for the trees. Is, is it the case? Does it remain the case that uh, that um, um, climate change of the right periodicity was was took place during during human evolution? Well, uh, this is uh, uh, this core uh, and uh, another composite core that that is supposed to be uh, forthcoming from East Africa, uh, uh, also going back about a million and a half years, seemed to show that the uh, the lower Pleistocene was less variable than the later Pleistocene. Uh, so that's one datum. Now, what we don't know actually is for sure. Uh, whether uh, the uh, uh, Pliocene and, and going on back is uh, what the uh, high frequency variation was doing in those time periods. Not a not a hint so far as I know of. Uh, and uh, uh, you can imagine when you want a thousand year resolution at the worst, uh, century level resolution, if you can get it, uh, uh, as you go start to go back, uh, millions hundreds of thousands and millions of years that's a lot of samples to deal with oh and, my gosh the fact that they can do so it the, um i don't know uh, we don't know uh, yet 
Now, one, it's, it's, it's sort of a circular argument, but if you imagine that brain size is a, uh, is a proxy for in high frequency environmental variation, then uh, there's this old data of Harry Jerison's, which suggests that uh, uh, mammals have been getting bigger. Mammals in general. Many ma mammal lineages have gotten bigger brains over the last 65 million years. And uh, a guy named Zacho said, uh, uh, at least he was at Santa Barbara, published a neat paper uh, oh, 20 years ago now or so, in which the uh, he has some, uh, it's not clear to me what it, what it is, but he, he has some notion about what the uh, climate variation is. It doesn't have anything to do with high frequency versus low frequency, but it seems to have been increasing uh, over the over the last 65 million years too. So there's a, a story to be told with uh, lots of loose ends. Uh, well, you're demonstrating why I call you my attic, my friend, and and um, and uh, and your mind is as sharp as it ever was. But uh, I want to finish up with uh, uh, your thoughts on practical applications. I mean, this is so great within inside the Ivy Tower. How should it be spilling out? How is it spilling out outside the Ivy Tower, and how should it? So, what what for you is the like the potential of these ideas to actually assist in in cultural evolution in the wild and in, in the real world. Yeah, so I uh, I guess in this regard, uh, you might call me uh, uh, conservative. I don't think we've got much to say to the applied world. And the reason is, uh, well, my object lesson is Randy Nessie's and company's uh, evolutionary medicine uh, initiative. Do you know, you know about this? Uh, sure. Yeah. And uh, they, by and large, failed. And why have they failed? Uh, they failed because uh, medical science and many applied sciences uh, uh, operate on the on what I call naive functionalism. Uh, your your kidney is isn't working. Yeah, your kidney's busted. Uh, the uh, medical science tries to find out what's wrong with your kidney in a very proximal sense. I mean. It, What's uh, what cells are not doing their job, uh, uh, and what can we do about it? Uh, uh, kidney transplants are uh, one extreme, uh, uh, but can we have drugs and lesser surgical procedures that correct uh, flaws? So uh, that that works well enough most of the time. So it seems to me that in medicine, the place where the ecological and evolutionary sciences have a a distinctive role to play is in epidemiology, because evolutionists, I mean, what do we, what's our special contribution? Our special contribution is to understand uh, uh, the dynamics of, uh, of evolving systems. And well, in, uh, if you think of population biology, ecology is, is similar to evolution, just you addresses normally somewhat different dynamic uh, problems. And in the in the latest uh, uh, COVID nineteen epidemic, that's where uh, the evolutionary science made a, a uh, distinctive contribution was via the epidemiological community who uh, figured out uh, what was driving the dynamics of the COVID eventually and and uh, and could recommend strategies for mitigating it. And on the other, the on the naive functionalism side, the uh, uh, the vaccine makers just went in there and, well, they had uh, uh, these modern techniques for making vaccines and they applied them on a on a heroic basis and got us our vaccines in in remarkably short order and and didn't didn't need any advice from evolutionists on how to make vaccines, which we know nothing about. I think one of the big problems is that uh, evolution. Uh, does deal in in uh, more ultimate kinds of causation and less with uh, proximate mechanisms. And the proximate mechanisms are really diverse and, and you only can uh, you know, figure out what the proximate mechanisms are by brute force uh, empiricism. Well, let me, let me pro propose two examples. And, and um, uh, one is the... Uh, the great work of Athena Actopus and others on cancer. I feel that's that's 
maybe even transform the study of cancer as um, as yeah, we, uh, multi level selection within the within the organism. That was an ecological and evolutionary approach, the cheating cell, and all that. I don't think that was just duplicated by. I mean that that uh, uh, is a great explanation for cancer. Now, uh, and the cancer is a uh, is a dynamic system, right? So the and it is a uh, it uh, the cancers are evolving on a uh, on a uh, on a short time scale, and so yeah, in uh, uh, in, I, I think that's a right way to think about cancer from a from a fundamental point of view, and I I, uh, I enjoy those papers. I think they're 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 quite good. Now, have they actually contributed anything to their cancer treatment therapy? That I don't know. One of yeah. my uh, one of our former um, uh, students, uh, uh, I'm blanking on his name. But, uh, it's not senility, David. I've always blanked on that. <laughs> Even when I was a youth. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he works on stoichiometry. He's worked on stoichiometry in lakes. And he got interested in the stoichiometry of cancers on the idea that you could uh, interfere if, if, say, uh, cancer cells need more phosphorus because they're they're uh, multiplying rapidly. They need more phosphorus in ordinary uh, body uh, cells. Then if you could find a way to starve a, uh, a cancer of phosphorus, uh, you could uh, interfere with its ability to spread. Uh, now, I yeah. don't know if this has resulted in any, uh, any uh, uh, successful therapies or not, but I guess my, what I'm saying is that there aren't applications, we, but I, you know, being around all these uh, applied scientists at Davis and having a little career as an applied limnologist myself, uh, 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 you, they're very problem centric. Uh, you know, you and once you think you figured out what the problem is, then you sort of recruit the science uh, uh, expediently to uh, to solve the problem, and sometimes. Uh, I think uh, uh, evolutionary scientists are going to have a role to play, and other times they're just going to—they uh, they can't do any better than the naive functionalism of the uh, that's so prevalent, say in, in. Well, let me give one ex other example. We'll wrap it up, Pete. But I think Michelle Gelfin's work on tight and loose cultures applied to the COVID epidemic uh, showed—I uh, forget what it was—fourfold. Um, uh, difference in infectious rate and sevenfold difference in mortality. And so this huge axis of variation from tight to loose uh, certainly bears upon response to COVID. Uh, so I, I would just nominate that as a, as a, um, you know, a cultural evolutionary approach, which is hugely relevant to, to many, many things, but uh, that including the... Um, yeah, again, uh, uh, that that is... Uh, a very plausible argument case she makes, and uh, but the, again, the case, how do you make a tight culture into a loose one, or a loose one into a tight one? Uh, uh, which was it? I forget which one had the uh, worst. Uh, the loose ones. The loose ones were the so least able to. Uh, no, I mean, tight is all about collective action, basically. Well, uh, collective action in, on a small scale. Uh, yeah, uh, no, it's a, that, that, a great yeah. collective action on a large scale. It's a scale issue. Mm, it <laughs> is, it is. But uh, so, I mean, that's fine for us to, uh, for but, you to be a conservative and for me to be a progressive on, on the practical applications of uh, cultural evolution. We'll see, we'll see what happens. And um, obviously, yeah. the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. I, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I uh, also came by my skepticism in in my. Uh, brief career as a business consultant, uh, uh, brief because it wasn't very successful. But <laughs> uh, one of the things that I discovered was that uh, uh, the advice that I came up with uh, was almost identical to the advice that uh, uh, mostly non-economist business school profs, uh, business schools had 
hired a fair number of sociologists and psychologists. Is it, uh, but of course, the, the con their their main uh, and most prestigious faculty were mostly economists, uh, and the kind of un unwashed economists of the old fashioned school. Yeah. And, Right. Uh, uh, that came up with the notion that uh, shareholder value is everything and, and that kind of bullshit. And the uh, sociologists and the psychologists were reacting to that, but with the same basic proximal arguments that, that I derived from. Well, like, with one uh, exception, I mean. And so, what, uh, and I tried to touch bases with these guys. I finally decided that one of the things they could use in their fight against the conservative economist was a sound theoretical basis of that they totally totally fully, that's just that's weren't just bullied by the been... economist yeah uh, but i mean that's important pete and so the way we put it um dennis snow and i is exactly that what we have is we have say what you like about neoclassical economics it is an integrative framework that lends itself to modeling and all that uh, it's being opposed by what we call diffuse pluralism many, many, many different critiques which don't cohere with each other. And so what's new and important is something that counts as an integrative framework that ties together diffuse pluralism and offers, brings these things which have been at the margins of the profession into the center. That's the contribution. And that's a very important contribution. Yeah, potentially. The, the trouble I found was when I tried to touch bases with these guys that uh, were the uh, making the most noise about this topic the, on, from the side of sociology and psychology was that they all had this uh, ingrained uh, uh, myth that uh, uh, Darwinism and evolution are inherently conservative uh, ideologies. Social, social Darwinism and all that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they didn't want to have anything to do with me. I was, I was <laughs> probably the enemy. That. Uh, All right. We did that a lot with anthropologists. And, oh yeah, we we did have a whole piece on why cultural anthropology and sociology, for that matter, has been last last to the table um, with respect to embracing modern uh, generalized Darwinism. Yes, well, they uh, Lewin and Gould. I blame it on them as much as anybody. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we could. Uh, this has been uh, great, Pete. So great. And I'm so happy to uh, have this conversation to offer it to others and and to continue to work with you. Lovely that you're still in the game so much. And uh, and uh, so uh, I think that uh, uh, I look forward to uh, to uh, uh, continuing uh, developing this paradigm. Always nice to talk to you, old friend. All righty. Okay. So let me. Uh...